everyone in Facebook land and in our Zoom today for a very special exploring tour with Celebration Magazine Live and the George W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum. I need to introduce to you Mr. Steve Eiler. Steve has been a volunteer, a docent, team leader, and content trainer at the George W. Bush Library and Museum for more than four years. Prior to his retirement in 2012, he was president of casualty claims for an international insurance company in New York City and a frequent industry speaker. Steve and his wife, Anne, have two children, a son and a daughter, and three grandchildren. So without further ado, Steve, take it away. We are so excited for our presentation from the George W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum. Thank you so much, Zoe. Um, and welcome and thanks to all of you who are with us today. I guess when we first started talking about this presentation, oh, several months ago, I was still hopeful that we could have presented it on site. But as we all know, times are different and um, we have to improvise. So it's my hope that this brief tour today will encourage you to visit in person when, once the museum does reopen. I will say this is the first virtual tour that we've ever done to my knowledge of the Bush Library. So let's consider ourselves all trailblazers today. So, a little bit of background, located on the campus of Southern Methodist University in Dallas, the George W. Bush Presidential Center Library and Museum serves as a resource for the study of the life and career of George W. Bush, while also promoting a better understanding of the presidency, American history, and important issues of public policy. And we'll talk about that as we go through the presentation. The library is the 13th presidential library administered by the National Archives and Records Administration. We know it by NARA, and that's a US federal agency. So uh, before we, we start, I would like to say that I am happy to take questions along the way. I ask that you sort of go easy. I've not been in the museum since March 8th, and um, sometimes we can forget a few things, but I'll do my best. And, um, but it's still possible that you could stump me with a question, but we'll see what we can do. So let's go to uh, slide one if we could, So, Okay, the first gallery in the museum is titled A Charge to Keep. And upon entering the museum, you'll get a flavor for the way that President Bush approached his responsibilities in both his president, presidency and his personal life. The top quote is taken directly from his first inaugural address and states, we are bound by ideals that move us beyond our backgrounds, lift us above our interests, and teach us what it means to be citizens. The quote below that is taken from President Bush's address to the Republican National Convention in 2000 when he was a candidate for the presidency. And he stated, the presidency is more than an honor, it is more than an office, it is a charge to keep, and I will give it my all. And you'll see that theme, a charge to keep, throughout the museum. Let's go to slide two if we could, please. This gallery serves as our introduction to the museum with the presentation of Bush family history and President Bush's service from Texas to the presidency. In this area, our visitors are immediately aware of the spirit of Texas, the strength of family, the power of faith, and the call to service. And next. Here we present President Bush's principles uh, or his key themes. The president has 12 such principles and I'll read them because this may not be clear to, to a lot of you as you see. Um, the first one, every child can learn. Free enterprise is the engine of prosperity. You can spend your money better than government can. Freedom is universal. Free people will set the course of history. To whom much is given, much is required. Results matter. Serve a purpose 
larger than yourself. We have a moral obligation to relieve suffering. Fighting disease abroad makes us safer at home. Every life is precious and the best hope for peace is the expansion of freedom. You'll find that in each of our galleries, one or more of these principles apply to the direction and decisions of President Bush in his personal life and in his presidency. Next slide, please. The gallery also chronicles George Bush's road to the presidency. You'll recall that this election was not without its challenges and controversy. The election of 2000 came down to the state of Florida, highly contested with recounts, flawed ballot, ballots. I think we all remember the new term hanging chads and ultimately intervention from the Supreme Court to resolve the conflicts. Within this area of um, the museum, we also feature our Charge to Keep Theater, which I'm excited for you all to see once you're able to get into the museum after it reopens. It's a great about 15 minute video and um, narrated by um, George and Laura Bush and others within his, um, within his presidency. Okay, next area. Um, the next area following the introduction is called Empowering Americans. President Bush optimistically began his presidency with a domestic agenda designed to improve the quality of life for all Americans. His education reform was designed to hold schools responsible for ensuring students were learning the skills that they needed to reach high school. President Bush believed tax cuts would stimulate the economy by allowing the public to choose how they would spend their money. And lastly, the faith-based and community initiative was designed to encourage nonprofits and faith-based community initiative was uh, faith-based organizations to stand in the gap and provide the needed services that the federal government could not legally provide to citizens. Area two touches on four of the 12 guiding principles and they are every child can learn, free enterprise is the engine of prosperity, you can spend your money better than the government can, results matter. Let me draw your attention, it's a, a little bit difficult to see, but beyond the yellow school bus, there's a kiosk there and it houses about, if I'm not uh, if I remember correctly, about 50 to 55 baseballs. President Bush's collection of baseballs is amazing. This is just a small sample. It's fun to look at some of the names. Um, a lot of legends um, have signed those, those baseballs. And the next slide, please. So as the president and the first lady rolled out their domestic agenda vision for our country, this was a time of great optimism. It was during these months post-election that we learned about No Child Left Behind, Mrs. Bush's National Book Festival, and you can see those, um, those posters uh, on the left, tax relief strategies designed to expand individual freedom while stimulating the economy, and in early September of 2001, the President and First Lady hosted their first state dinner with President and Mrs. Vincente Fox of Mexico. Featured in this exhibit is the dress that was worn by Laura Bush. It was designed by couturier Arnold Scazzi. It features the vivid colors of red and hot pink and evokes the vibrancy and colors of Mexico. It's very difficult to see, but underneath the lace top of that dress is lined with, uh, with the hot pink color. And it's absolutely beautiful when you see it in, in person. Okay, let's move on to the next gallery. So a few days after the state dinner, our country experienced the day of fire. September 11th is seared in our nation's memory as the day that changed America. And indeed, it completely changed the Bush presidency. All Americans shared in the shock and grief. 
The September 11th exhibit area is a memorial that serves as a permanent reminder of the acts of terror that occurred on American soil. President Bush wanted to ensure that people never forget what happened that day. The exhibit path takes you around some of the World Trade Center steel wreckage in a circle from right to left along the wall. The walls are engraved with the names of almost 3,000 victims of the terror attacks in New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania. The names are arranged alphabetically from top to bottom and from right to left along the wall by the victim's location, which are Flight 11, first responders, then Flight 11, Flight 175, Flight 77, Flight 93, the Pentagon, the World Trade Center North Tower, and the World Trade Center South Tower. There are six monitors on this wall arranged around the perimeter of the circle. The day of fire unfolds in pictures and sound on the monitors, one defining moment at a time, and in the order that they occurred. Next slide, please. It is in this area that we, were, we are able to view and read excerpts from President Bush's addresses to the nation on the evening of September, 2000, September 11, 2001. And these are actual documents that he used during his address to the nation. Any questions so far? No, we are looking good so okay. far, although we did have um, someone state that they absolutely love the 12 principles. So I, they're, they're, they're just amazing. I mean, and those have been, he's followed those guiding principles throughout his life. And it's nice that he shares those with us. In the museum itself, in the first uh, gallery, they actually shine from above and change on the floor. So you're actually able to read them all on the floor and it's quite impressive. How beautiful. And, and I'm gonna date myself when I say this, but, but this is the first presidential election that I was old enough to vote in. So, <laughs> I very much remember uh, the, the Florida recounts and everything stepping in because it, it was really, I mean, it was the first that really applied to me as an adult. So it's, uh, it's really interesting to uh, it was It was my first election too to vote as well. So I'm with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> actually, and it's interesting when you do go through area one, we actually have the butterfly va ballot that was used in the state of Florida. And you can see it with the hanging chads and it is very confusing. Oh, wow. Very interesting artifacts that go along with that as well. Wow, okay, awesome. Um, okay, so I do see one other question here. So someone's asking actually, what's the admission charge to come into the um, museum when it's open? When it's open, um, yes. I believe it is $18 unless that's changed. And there is a senior discount. And um, I'm not exactly sure what that is. Okay, all right. Um, just another comment in here from uh, Carla. Um, she said that No Child Left Behind steered a lot of the curriculum when she was teaching. It so absolutely. she got to experience that. It absolutely did. And what was yes. great about, <laughs> about No Child Left Behind is that that was, that was fueled an awful lot by Laura Bush and mm -hmm. with tremendous bipartisan support. And when in, in, in that particular part of the gallery, there's also a, a painting, a watercolor painting that was done by Senator Ted Kennedy mm -hmm. and presented to Laura Bush um, in appreciation for all of the work that she had done and education and literacy and um, No Child Left Behind. How neat, how neat. All right, well, I think for now that does it with our comments and questions, so let's move, move on. To the next gallery. The next gallery is titled, entitled Defending Freedom, and this part of the gallery discusses the President's response to September 11, the war on global terrorism. President Bush created a four-part plan that became known as the Bush Doctrine. 
It is concise and direct and consists of the four items, Take the first one being take the fight to the enemy, make no distinction between terrorists and the nations that harbor them, confront threats before they fully emerge, and advance freedom. Now, it was during this period that President Bush worked with Congress and signed into law the USA Patriot Act. It gave law enforcement officials and intelligence agencies the tools they needed in this new war on terror. Prior to the events of September 11th, there was little coordination or sharing of information among the federal agents um, and intelligence on intelligence and response strategies. And from that, the Department of Homeland Security was created to coordinate government efforts and that uh, federal agency um, still remains today. So the crown jewel, our next area. The Oval Office. The Oval Office exhibit in the George W. Bush Presidential Library and Museum is an exact replica in scale and design of the one in the White House and looks just as it did during the administration of President George Bush. Everything in the office is a replica of the original. So what I mean by that is that there are no actual artifacts in, the, um, in our Oval Office. That is, unless I'm working in the Oval Office on a particular day, and then I am considered to be the only artifact in the room. You're supposed to laugh. I giggled. <laughs> so a, tr a tradition evolved in the latter part of the 20th century of each new administration, redecorating the office to suit the president's personal taste, choosing new furniture, new draperies, and designing their own oval-shaped carpet to take up most of the floor. The paintings are selected from either the White House's own collection or borrowed from other museums for the president's term in office. Next slide, please. So some, uh, a little bit of uh, data here. The Oval Office is 816.2 square feet. That's 35 feet, 10 inches in length and 29 feet wide. The ceiling height is 18 feet, six inches. Many presidents have used a large partner's desk. Could we go back to the, the former slide just so we can take a look at the Resolute desk while I'm, I'm going through this area. Um, this is called the Resolute desk and it's so named because it was made from the timbers of the British ship HMS Resolute. The ship was frozen in Arctic ice and abandoned, but later found and fixed by American seamen and returned to the United Kingdom in 1856. When the ship was decommissioned in 1879, Queen Victoria asked for three desks to be made from her timbers. One of the three, a large partner's desk made from the ship's dark oak, was presented to then President Rutherford B. Hayes on November 23rd 1880. A number of presidents used it as their private office desk in the Yellow Oval Room and elsewhere. First Lady Jacqueline Kennedy, seeking to honor her husband's military service with a nautical theme, was the first to place it in the Oval Office for JFK. There was one change that was made um, to the, actually there are two changes made to the desk. You'll see that there's a panel in the front and when it, when it was uh, received, it was a partner, so it was open on both ends. Um, FDR had that modesty panel placed in that space on the, the front side because he was in a wheelchair and didn't want people to see him um, sitting in the wheelchair. It's also um, that tra trap door. It's actually a door that opens, and we all remember the iconic photo of John John Kennedy peeking through that, that um, modesty panel. Um, during the JFK presidency. Following the 1963 assassination of President Kennedy, the Resolute Desk actually toured the country as part of a traveling exhibit for the Kennedy Library. 
and was then sent to the, to the Smithsonian Institution. President Carter returned the desk to the Oval Office in the 1970s, and since then, Presidents Reagan, Clinton, George W. Bush, Obama, and Trump have used it as their Oval Office desk. The Resolute is one of six desks ever used in the Oval Office. Okay, we could go back to the next slide, so. President Bush had a pale gold rug with its signature ray shooting out from the presidential seal. And he often remarked that the rug reflected his optimism about America as it reminded him of the rays of the sun. The presidential seal is surrounded by a ring of olive branches alternating, of course, with the Lone Star of Texas. The rug measures 30 feet, five inches by 23 feet, five inches and is similar in design to the rug that President Ronald Reagan had designed for his Oval Office. This beautiful carpet was designed by Laura Bush and Fort, Fort Worth designer Ken Blassengang. And if you haven't visited the museum and seen it, it's absolutely exquisite. Note the large clock in the Northeast portion of the room. It's a Seymour tall case clock. The case of this clock, a form frequently made in New England, is an important example of the superb craftsmanship of father and son cabinet makers, John and Thomas Seymour of Boston. And it was crafted sometime between the years 1795 and 1805. It's made of mahogany, crotch, birch, and satinwood veneers. And the eight foot 10 inch case also features a double lunette inlay, which is a little difficult to see and that was a sophisticated Seymour ornament. Although its dial is unmarked, the movement may have been made by James Duell of Charlestown, Massachusetts, whose name appears on, the clock, on clocks with similar Seymour cases. This piece was acquired in 1972 and has stood in the Oval Office since 1975. It is truly one of the most beautiful clocks in the White House collection. Most recent presidents have hung a portrait of George Washington over the mantel on the north end of the room. This portrait is by Rembrandt Peale, and it's called a porthole portrait due to its design, which is obvious. It was painted about 1823. The second presidential portrait in the Oval Office of George W. Bush is Abraham Lincoln by George Henry Story. Each president usually hangs in that particular spot uh, the portrait of their predecessor who they feel was the most influential in their life. President Bush chose Abraham Lincoln as he felt he had the most trying job of any president in preserving the Union. President Bush selected five paintings for his office that would remind him of Texas. Most were on loan from museums in San Antonio and El Paso. These are a little bit difficult to see, but to the left of the museum, the top, top picture is Chili Queens of the Alamo. And below that, which you cannot see, and I'm sorry for that, is Cactus Flowers. Both of those pieces were painted by Texas artist Julian Onderdock. And to the right of the fireplace, you'll see Rio Grande, by Thomas Lay, another Texas art, art, artist. And near the Resolute desk, you may have seen near San Antonio, the beautiful painting of the Blue Bonnets, also painted by Julian Onderdon. Note the Swedish ivy that sits on the fireplace mantle. This was first propagated by Jackie Kennedy all the way back in 1960. From, and she took clippings from the Rose Garden, and the ivy still lives to this day. I've always said someone's being paid an awful lot to keep that ivy alive. Mm -hmm. From 2001 to 2008, George W. Bush, our 43rd president, had a special tradition. We often get the question, does the fireplace work in the Oval Office, and indeed it does. And when the temperature dropped to 43 degrees outside, the staff would set a fire in the Oval Office fireplace, whether the president was there or not. And then located through the double doors 
on the right um, in the museum Oval Office. The Texas Rose Garden pays homage to the White House Rose Garden, the setting for many presidential remarks and ceremonies. Both the Texas Oval Office and the Rose Garden have the same Southwest sun exposure as the originals in the White House. Our Texas Rose Garden is approximately the same shape as the uh, Rose Garden in the Oval Office, but considerably smaller. And the vegetation is different to take into consideration the much different climate in the city of Dallas. Any right. questions though? We do, we got quite a few. So someone okay. asked um, if it was a Remington statue on the left table by the, the presidential desk in the first picture. Well, that person has a good eye because <laughs> it is, and that is Remington's Bronco Buster. Nice. And it's a beautiful, beautiful piece. Okay. All right. So we also, let's see, someone said they've been to the museum twice. It's wonderful. There's a lot to see. Um, okay. So we do have a question about the plate in this picture, the plates on the left side that are on the bookshelf. They okay. asked what those are and then what pictures are underneath it okay the pictures underneath first of all are all of family um, and on the on the table the console table behind the resolute desk you'll also see a, a number of, photo, of photographs and those are all of uh, the bush family as well including um miss beasley and uh barney as well mm, note the books the books are um are exact replicas of, of books that are owned by President Bush. Hmm. And there are quite a few, and they're really interesting, most notably a complete set of the Lewis and Clark books. The plates and other porcelain pieces that are on the shelves are purely decorative, but they all have one thing in common. If you look closely at them when you visit, you'll see that every single piece of porcelain or china has the American Eagle on it. Oh, very neat, very neat. Okay, and then uh, someone asked if they burned wood in the fireplace or if it's gas fired. It, it, it is completely wood burning, yes. Oh, that's a great smell. All right, um, let's see. Um, no, ours does not work in the museum. <laughs> just for show, that's right. <laughs> it's beautiful. Um, so Nancy Wilder said she's toured the museum a few years ago and that your narrative is providing more in-depth information than she's ever gotten, so she's loving. It. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> There's so much history. Um, I mean, I could go on for hours about the history in the in the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. It's you know, unfortunately, we just can't cover it all in in the time that we have allotted. But they're yeah. incredible. It's incredible. So so they did ask if the ivy at your museum is done from cuttings of the original ivy in Washington. Well, I'll let you in on a secret. Our ivy is artificial. Oh, <laughs> all right. That's why it looks so good. <laughs> there's, not, there's not a one of us that would be able to keep it alive. So it's best done this way. Now the ivy is removed at, um, during the holidays and it's replaced. Now it's still taken care of, but it's replaced by garland that's wrapped by the stars and stripes and mm. it's huge and it's beautiful. And then uh, we, uh, there was also a, a, there was also a Christmas tree in the, in the Oval Office. So it's really spectacular during the holiday time. Mm, how nice. Um, uh, so someone asked about the flowers on the coffee table and did the Oval Office always have a centerpiece like that in it? Always, and they're always fresh. And this is typical of what you might have seen um, uh, during the Bush presidency. Mrs. Bush loves roses. So mm -hmm. this, was a, this was a copy of one of, the, one of the arrangements that she had had done at one point with multicolor roses. Very nice. Yeah, those are beautiful. I love the colors. Um, so um, Joe said um, that they've been to the museum and they've enjoyed it so much, but they're learning so much more now, which they really appreciate. Thank you. Um, Cynthia said that it's so much fun to have your picture taken at the Resolute Desk. Um, 
And, and I have to say, Steve, you kind of, you know, we're doing these, um, we, we're doing movie nights with my son and we recently watched National Treasure and hearing you talk about the Resolute Desk, I'm like, wait a minute, I heard about that not too long ago. I mean, perfect. It's absolutely perfect. Um, Carla would like to know when you start decorating for the holidays. And I guess the other question would be is, is do you anticipate being open for the holidays this year? You know, regrettably, we will not. I just don't, unless there's some miracle that takes place, um, I don't see it happening this year. Um, typically, we start um, decorating probably the 1st of October. Mm -hmm. Understanding our special exhibit hall, it takes months to get right. things ready. Um, although they, they start um, getting things ready down in the archives well before October, but then they start actually working on the special exhibit right around the 1st of October or after, uh, if we're having another special exhibit before that, they'll start working immediately thereafter. So it takes that much time. And we typically open the, the holiday exhibit the week before Thanksgiving, and then it goes through the first week in January. Wonderful. All right. So keep that in mind, everyone. Next year, group trip, we're all going to check out the holiday decorations. The and holiday I'll, be there to, I'll be there to take you all through. Oh, that would be so much fun. Oh, that, I, I, might, I might have to make that one happen. <laughs> All right. Um, and then uh, Helen David said she went several years ago with a group and she's learning so much more now. I definitely, uh, you know, will make the comment, me personally, um, I think if you've been there hearing, or even if you have it, hearing this presentation, when you're able to go, um, it would just, I think it would really make it special. So. Um, uh, yeah. The great, uh, thing about the, the great thing about the Oval Office, and because there are no um, actual pieces um, and all replicas, it's made to be lived in. And mm -hmm. Mrs. Bush has said time and time and again that she wants this to be a special place where people can come and sit down on the chairs, relax on the sofa, and just take a little breather. And it works perfectly for that purpose. How neat, how neat. So everyone said yes, that we need to make that tour happen. Right. Um, and you're adding a new layer that you've, they've never experienced. And also um, they asked if there's an audio tour that goes along with the exhibits, if you come in for a tour. Actually there is. And um, what you do is before you come um, to, to the museum, you would download from on your iPhone the GWB Center, and that will that will take you section by section through all of the galleries and explain in as much depth as you would like what you're seeing in each one of our galleries. Very very neat. Okay, um, we do have more to go through, so um, I'm do a couple little things. Um, Someone asked about the jewelry on display, if Laura ever gets to wear any of it. Um, and then Madon, now this is very interesting. He says it's a side note, but I think it's extremely important. Uh, Madon was the first person in line at the public opening of the library years ago. He got there about six hours before opening time and waited in line. So that's really neat. What a tribute. Thank yeah. That's yes. Terrific. How cool. All right. I think so that's the, the jewelry. jewelry. Let me just yes. tell you briefly. We have um, cases in Free Freedom Hall. So when you first enter the, the museum, the library, mm -hmm. you'll see along the walls these cases that in that have artifacts in them. These are gifts to the president and Mrs. Bush or other staff members during his presidency mm -hmm. from foreign dignitaries or special invited guests. And they're, they're geographically separated. So you'll see some from Russia, you'll see some from um, uh, the Far East, all over the globe. And um, this is just a sampling, what we show um, of the gifts and we change those around. I think in terms of jewelry, what probably is being discussed is um, there's a sapphire and diamond set, which is 
more opulent than probably anything you've ever seen. It includes a necklace, a bracelet, a ring, and earrings. And it was gifted to Laura Bush um, from King Abdullah. Um, the, uh, um, the jewelry is there for everyone to enjoy. If you have ever had the pleasure to meet Laura Bush, you will know that that's not her style. Uh, but she is free to wear those items if she wants um, and take, take them out. Um, any gift, and back in, in the presidency years for George W. Bush, any gift given to them over $325 in value um, had to be surrendered. And mm. lucky for us, because we get to see them in the museum. Very neat. Well, I, I think I'm a big jewelry fan. I think I would have been heartbroken if I'd have had to give stuff like that up. No. <laughs> yeah. oh, all right. Well, I think um, <laughs> Barbara's are right in line with me. She said, I remember a plaque that said the jewels belong to the people of the United States. Yes. When can I borrow them is what she said. I am right on line with her on that come one. See, come <laughs> see me, Barbara, and I'll see if I can wrap it up for you. <laughs> That's great. All right, Steve. So let's uh, let's so continue on our journey. On the next slide, then. And just wanted to mention that the president and Mrs. Bush have always referred to the White House as the People's House. The Bush Oval Office was regularly used to welcome visiting dignitaries and people of all walks of life. It was not uncommon to see situations like this depicted here. Uh, going on in the Oval Office. And here also you get a pretty good look at the Oval Office rug with the presidential seal. Yeah, that's a beautiful rug. Absolutely stunning. And the blue bonnets on the left. Mm -hmm. Okay, next slide, please. This area, uh, right after the Oval Office, is titled Living in the White House. And this gallery divides the story into the multiple roles of the White House, including as a workplace, as a home, as a house of state, and as a museum. A White House, the home of the American president, is a national symbol, a museum, and an office where the president conducts official business. George and Laura Bush respect the history of the White House, as well as its beauty and traditions, and they enjoyed sharing it with the American people. The Bushes refurbished many of its treasured rooms during their term, uh, including the Lincoln bedroom and the great room. In this slide, this is one of the best, uh, people love this part of the, of the Living in the White House exhibit. There's so much here, but in this slide, you'll see details of the state dinner in honor of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II and His Royal Highness Prince Philip. And that was held on May 7th, of 2007. What's interesting is that this was the first white tie event that the president and Mrs. Bush had hosted. And what you see here is Mrs. Bush chose an ice blue embroidered gown and it was designed by Oscar de la Renta, one of her favorites. When you come to the, the museum, you'll see a number of other gowns that were designed by Oscar de la Renta. Any questions there? Uh, not so far, just some comments that people have met Laura Bush and she is so sweet. Um, and then Janet said she is reading a book currently called The First Ladies and it was written by the head usher for Roosevelt through Bush. Um, and so that's really interesting and just statements that they remember that gown. So you can go ahead. It's, it's a stunning piece of... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, just incredible when you look at it you can't we can't see all of the the beadwork uh, on the bolero top but it's just it's just unbelievable and indeed mrs bush is as charming as um she appears she's absolutely lovely lady okay next area this area is called acting with compassion you'll recall that humanitarianism was very important to president mrs bush and they believe that it is important to serve a larger purpose. That ring should ring a bell as one of the principles. And additionally, President Bush believed that by improving the quality of life in our global citizens, he was protecting America 
yet another one of his principles. So in this gallery, we touch on the following programs that were developed during the Bush presidency. The first one is the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, and we call that PEPFAR, the President's Malaria Initiative, PMI, and the Millennium Challenge Corporation, MCC. So PEPFAR and PMI were created to reduce the death toll from AIDS and malaria abroad, and the Millennium Challenge Corporation is a program that provides funding to countries that are willing to work to build their infrastructure or solve problems such as clean water, agricultural farming, and others. Questions? No questions. We can move on. Okay. The next gallery is called Decision Points Theater, and I apologize for the quality of this slide. That's actually a video screen that you're looking at, and so it's difficult to capture that in a still. But this exhibit actually provides a very different viewpoint of President Bush's administration. It's interactive and fun, and there's absolutely no stress involved in this, even though you're going to be making some decisions. There were certain events and decisions made during the Bush administration that were very controversial. Decision Points Theater and Interactive Experience allows our guests to actually sit in the chair of the president and examine information, news, and expert opinions surrounding those events that, and then make informed decisions about how to respond to the scenarios. And they include responding to the threat of Saddam Hussein, the surge or sending of troops into Middle East countries, Hurricane Katrina, and the financial crisis of 2008. And you're asked to make a decision about what you would do had you been George W. Bush at that time, and then you get to see how the audience voted, and you get to see if you did the same thing or you selected the same decision that President Bush did. So it's a lot of fun. Okay, next section mm -hmm. is titled Leading on the Issue. And this exhibit is separated into five sections, volunteering, protecting the environment, separating powers, crisis management, and looking to the horizon. President Bush faced unexpected problems such as Hurricane Katrina and the financial crisis. Other problems were apparent before he entered office, such as the need to reform Medicare, immigration, and social security. Leading on the issues really highlights President Bush's decision-making process, and it is, number one, defining a vision, number two, articulating principles, number three, listening to others, number four, weighing different options, and finally, making a decision. Very, very strategic. Questions? We're good. You okay. can keep Next section, this is a new call to service. And in our final exhibit area, President Bush makes the transition from US president to US citizen. And I love this, you'll note down in the bottom, that actually appears on the floor where he steps from president over to American citizen. President and Mrs. Bush are still working on important issues through the George W. Bush Presidential Center. The Institute continues to work to advance freedom through education reform, improve global health, expand human freedom, and address economic growth. The Institute empowers women through its women's initiatives and honors the service of our US service men and women through its military service initiative. And the next slide, please. So this concludes our virtual tour. I've attempted, I think, to provide what I consider to be the most important highlights in the museum. Understandably, it's impossible to include everything. And I assure you that when you are able to visit in person, you'll learn much, much more about the eight years of the Bush presidency. In addition to the permanent galleries, the museum regularly features special exhibits. Some of you may have attended those. The on-site archives 
house hundreds of thousands of artifacts, including, as I said, eight years of holiday decorations. And over the years, the special exhibit space has been converted each November to Christmas in the White House, where our guests are able to see the actual ornaments and other decorations featured from 2001 to through 2008. And as a little enticement, our next special exhibit will open the first week in March of 2021, and it will include, again, a number of paintings by George Bush of immigrants this time, and features their journeys to United States citizenship. I'm so happy to have been with you all today for this presentation, and I will look forward to welcoming all of you to our museum once it opens again. And if there are any other questions, I'll be happy to take those at this time. How are we doing? Thank on time? We, we have a million people um, that are just beaming about how much they enjoyed the presentation. Oh, they said they learned so much. It was fun. They hope to visit. Um, they said if they come, they hope that you are their guide. <laughs> okay, I do as well. <laughs> Thank you so much for a wonderful tour. Excellent presentation. So we do have a question of do the exhibits change or do the main ones stay the same? We refer to what we've gone through today as our permanent exhibit. Um, now that's not to say that there are certain artifacts that will be changed from time to time. Um, the Oval Office never changes except at the holidays, as I mentioned. We put the tree up and the garland over the mantle. Um, but that's because we wanted to preserve how it ac actually looked during the Bush presidency. But some of the um, display cases throughout the museum, mm -hmm. sometimes we change um, some of the artifacts in there because we, in, in some of those areas, particularly acting with compassion, we have a number of pieces and artifacts that were presented to the president and Mrs. Bush um, in appreciation for the work they did globally um, to advance freedom in those countries. And so there are a number of artifacts that are very interesting and, and pertinent. And so we'll change some of those out as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, I, I got to say, everyone said thank you. Everyone, if you want to take yourselves off of mute, let's give Steve a round of applause and a whoop whoop and a let's let him hear our Hey, hey. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. When the museum reopens, I'm always there on Monday morning. Yeah. Monday, okay. And other times um, when I can. All right. So if you want to hunt down Steve, we got to go on a Monday morning. So that's what you're telling us. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, I'll I'll Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, everyone, thank you so much. Thank you, Facebook, for joining us live today. Oops, I'm getting a little bit of feedback here. Um, thank you so much for joining us live today on Facebook. If you would like to join us on uh, live on Zoom, you can go to celebrationmagazine.com. Now, I am saving this very special. Someone else said they would love to see another presidential library tour, and we actually uh, do have one planned. I am going to keep really? that in prize for you as to which Ooh. one. You have to keep an eye on our website. You have to look in the magazine. 